Um, okay, M- Michigan wins for the third straight year. And I tell you what, 30 to 24, <clears throat> that was another fantastic addition of the game. And let me just start by saying that that game lived up to its hype. All right. Not not always do we get a game as compelling as the one that we saw on Saturday. And that game was fantastic. It was it was really well played. There were plays made on both sides. There were answers. What I love about, you know, sports is when a team you know like gives up a score and then they answer and then maybe there's another score and then they answer and it this game had that. There was just constant answering and and these two teams are really good teams and they played like it on Saturday. Uh it was not the the second half bludgeoning of 2021 where Michigan just overpowered Ohio State. It wasn't even, you know, the the dynamic big plays that we saw in 2022. This one was a more evenly played game. It was it was really um, a battle throughout. I um, enjoyed it immensely. If you look at the stat sheet, you know, it was incredibly evenly played. I think Ohio State actually outgained Michigan per play and maybe even in total yards. And again, Ohio State kept answering. Every time Michigan would score, they would answer. And it was always going to come down to a couple of moments. And and we'll get to that a, a little bit. But 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 before we get into the more specifics, if you're a Michigan fan, this does not get old. Hearing the last call, this is how it sounded when Rod Moore got that interception. McCord looks, fires, intercepted. Rod Moore and Michigan will win the game. And there's the interception. A play on a drive like that, either side will live forever. And Rod Moore makes it and seals a victory for Michigan for the third straight win in this series. Man, incredible game. And that was a great series that Ohio State was putting together and, and Michigan kept answering and they would have an adjustment on defense. And again, it was just back and forth and back and forth. It was fantastic. Loved watching it. Loved calling that game. And in the end, what happened is something that I had touched on during most of the game, which was that pressure from the defensive front of Michigan showed up. I talked about several times during the game, the stunts and the twists uh, that the defensive line uses for Michigan and and how effective that they have been over the course of the year. And sure enough, what happens? It was It was a stunt. Jalen Harrell, he comes inside. I believe it was Mason Graham goes outside, and Harrell did an excellent job of knocking the guard down, the center down, and then finding a lane to the quarterback, and it was that pressure that caused Kyle McCord to throw that ball off target, and Rod Moore ends up picking it off. So that's where I wanted everyone should know like how incredible it is to get a game with undefeateds, to get a game with two programs playing at their best, at their peak, and to get the the vitriol and the hate where it was this weekend, it's even more th- than hate. I mean, there was so much riding on this game. And then to have the game that we did and the back and forth nature of the game and the physicality of the game, that was, man, that was awesome. It was awesome. Um, I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, and now we've got to analyze it. What went on? What happened? What went wrong for Ohio State? What went right for Michigan? Uh, let's start with the coaches because a lot of people are going to start with the coaches. And I want to start with with just the decisions that they made because you've got to give Sharon Moore, acting coach, doesn't have a big history in this game. Man, he played with the freedom of someone with no scar tissue in the game. He coached and made decisions with no scar tissue. And it was evident. He went for it on fourth down three times. They scored touchdowns on each drive that he went for it. He went for it fourth and goal from the one. He gets into the end zone. 
And then he converted two fourth downs, really back-to-back, back-to-back sets of downs. Goes forward on fourth and one, Blake Corum runs for a yard. Then, you know, uh, first down, second down, third down, gets it back to a a, a fourth down, goes forward again, throws it it to Colston Loveland. Um, And by the way, the first one in that sequence set up the second one, same formation. And it it looked like, as I'm watching the film, it looked like they had the pass to Colston Loveland called on the first fourth and one. And they check out of it because they were trying to throw it to the wide side of the field. But because it was the wide side of the field, Ohio State's defense had kind of stretched out and there was a a further support player on that side outside. So they checked it. Blake Corum went from Colston Loveland's side, which was the right side of the quarterback, to the left side of the quarterback. They called the dive. They get it. First down, second down, third down. They get back now into a fourth and one. They get into the exact same formation. And now it's Colson Loveland's on the right side again in that little wingback uh, formation, double tight. And yet it's to the short side of the field. And so th- then the defense condenses. Well, they're in that same formation. Now Corum is on Loveland's side. They look over for the, for the check and they keep it on. And then they give the fake to Corum and they throw it to Colson Loveland. So, so the first fourth down builds into the second fourth down. And again, so that is not just the decision of how you go for it or how aggressive you're going to be, but then it's also he's the offensive coordinator and he's building and sequencing into success. I love that about Sharon Moore. Those two fourth downs happen on the same drive that uh, they threw the touchdown pass to, to Roman Wilson over the middle. And that play, man, I could talk about that play for five, 10 minutes just in and of itself. Um, so much on that play. And I know a a lot of people upset from the Michigan side about my thoughts that, that I thought the Roman Wilson touchdown, you know, maybe wasn't to catch, but it stood and it's a touchdown. Uh, but that was a close call. There's, there's clearly, that was a close call. Now the other side, Ryan day coaching. So Sharon Moore, he's coaching and operating with no scar tissue. He's got the freedom of not having a long memory. He's got the freedom of being kind of the, 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 the naive, youthful coach. And, and maybe that's, that's not meant to be a shot. I mean, there's, again, a lot of freedom to that. He hasn't had to sit in a press conference after losing this game. Now, he's lost the game as an assistant coach, never as a coordinator, but as an assistant coach. But that's different than being the head coach and making the decisions and sitting in front of the microphone and taking the questions. You know, Jim Harbaugh has scar tissue from this game. Ryan Day now has scar tissue from this game. And Sharon Moore doesn't in that role. And he coached like it. He coached like it. They were aggressive. And and they also ran the the kind of double passy type of deal, like the the halfback pass with Donovan Edwards, the first play of the fourth quarter. He told us he was going to be aggressive. He told his his team he was going to be aggressive, and then he was. So credit to him. Ryan Day, he was put into some situations that were not as advantageous. Okay, listen, fourth and goal from the one, if you're Michigan, you're probably going to go for it, right? Like if he kicks that, everyone's like, why did you kick that? Blake Corum's the best short yardage back in the country. You've won the Joe Moore Award twice, right? So Sharon's decision on the fourth and goal wasn't much of a decision. Even fourth and one, they're on the plus side of the 50. Like those are those are pretty heavy go for it mentality plus side of the 50. So like the situation lent itself to him going for it. Not the case for Ryan Day's decisions. In fact, Ryan Day's decisions were at that place where you're like, dang it. It's a much tougher decision to go for it on fourth and one when you're in your own territory. Because remember, a failed fourth and one. So Ryan Day, fourth and one at his own 46 on the second drive of the game. Okay. So it's only the second drive of the game, but He's got fourth and one, but it's his own 46. Field goal range for Michigan is the 35. So you see, like, depending on what happens on that fourth down, if you don't even, if you don't get it, one first down, you give up one first down, they're in scoring territory. So a failed fourth down there is almost automatically three points for your opposition. It's not the plus side where where they've got to drive and get two or three first downs in order to get in field goal range. So you've got some ability to recover from 
from not making that first down if it's on the plus side of the 50, like Sharon Moore's were. You know, those are, I don't call them no-brainers because, again, I, I gave him credit, and you should give him credit. Days were a little bit more difficult. So it's like, I don't know. That's a tough decision. He punted. Okay, He knew his defense was going to play well. He knew that Michigan's defense was going to play well, and he felt like points were going to be at a premium. So why artificially give them three points early in the game? Okay, so like that's why I didn't say anything about it in the course of the broadcast. And then late in the second quarter, and this is what a lot of people are going to talk about, he played conservative and played for a field goal. So the clock is, is under a minute. And now it's fourth and two, and now you're on the Michigan 34. Okay. Now, with where the clock is at, I it's, it's a lower percentage that if you fail, Michigan's going to go get points. I understand he probably didn't want to give Michigan the ball. But with where the clock was at again, I think there was like 34, 35 seconds right around there. And the fourth and two meant that if you're going to kick it, it's a 52-yard field goal. Their kicker's range was a long of 50. So you're stretching the range of your kicker and, and settling for that. Now, Travion had been great in the last few weeks. Obviously, you've got Harrison and Abuka. You've got Cade Stover. Like, you've got a, a very good offense. He played to drain the clock and kick the field goal. Now, to be fair, kicker had plenty of leg. And, and forgive me, I'm, I'm blanking the name. Hold on really quick. Sorry, I didn't do that beforehand. I, I normally have my boards here. So now I've got I've got the boards here. So in my boards, yeah, you see you got like I got all, all my notes and <clears throat> and all my boards if you're watching on YouTube. All right. Cuz I wanted to say these numbers correctly. And again, bear with me if you're you're tuning in and you fast forward or something. I do have a cough drop but and got pretty sick after the game, but I'm here cuz I want to react to this. Okay. Uh Fielding, their kicker, 14 of 16 on the year, long of 47 on the season, but did make from 50 going back to high school. Has a good leg. He's handled kickoff duties since last season. So it's like he made the first one, okay? He made the first one. I thought what was... What was interesting is like once he realizes like okay I'm going to I'm going to kick the field goal. I'm not going for it. I'm kicking the field goal. I'm taking the points. That's fine. And then he did the correct thing which was put the onus on Sharon Moore by not taking his timeout. Now I'm going to take a timeout with 3 seconds left so that the kick ends the half and I don't have to kick off after the field goal. Smart thing to do. So this is when Sharon Moore has a decision to make. I'm going to take my timeout to make sure I have 30 seconds so that I get a kick return or I'm going to save that timeout so that I can ice the kicker because you can't do both because you can't call back-to-back -back timeouts. And I, I, that's a, a miss. I always replay things that was a miss for me during the broadcast. I should have said that on the broadcast. If Sharon Moore, again, let me just reiterate, Ryan Day with about, you know, that's like th mid 30s seconds left to go in the half, decides to, he's got one timeout left, it's fourth and two. He decides, I'm kicking. Okay, he does then the smart thing and says, I'm going to wait till the clock is three seconds so that the field goal ends the half. Sharon Moore cannot take back-to-back -back timeouts. So he's got, even though he has multiple timeouts left, he's got one in the chamber. He can either use it to save time so that he gets a kickoff return and a chance with his offense, or he saves it to ice the kicker. He saves it to ice the kicker. They take a timeout right before the snap. Snap. Ohio State does the proper thing. They go through the whole mechanics. Fielding kicks it. Boom. It's good. All right. There was a timeout. Now it's on because you know you can't take a second timeout. So what happens? Fielding misses. And then that becomes like one of, if not the biggest play of the game. So we go back to the coaching Everything that happened in that 
you know, is, is, is hard. It's hard because again, I wish I would have. So day's decision to not go for it there. Everyone's like, well, you had time. He's got to go for it. Okay. Okay. Even if he goes for it, how much are you increasing your probability that your of your make probability, right? So think of it this way: he's putting at, at, at fourth and two. You know, you've got X percent chance. Let's just say it's like fifty fifty or fifty five percent or fifty seven percent. Okay, to to get the first down. Well, even if you make it, you're only increasing your make probability because of the shorter field goal by a little bit because you're already stretching the range of the kicker. In his mind, what's different between a a 47-yard field goal and a 52-yard field goal? I bet you with Fielding's percentages, it's not much. So why risk the fourth down to just gain a small you know, numbers advantage in terms of the shorter field goal. Now, could you have, could you make the argument like, well, you could have taken a couple of shots. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the argument is that if you get the first down, you still have a timeout and you can take a couple of shots and maybe you get down there to make it a 20 yard field goal. Maybe you get down maybe you can score. Maybe Harrison makes a great catch. I think a lot of, you know, so that's going to be debatable, but again, Like, Day was forced with more difficult decisions than Sharon. Now, Sharon aggressively and and with with no scar tissue made bold decisions and coached a wonderful game. Like I said, even the, the play calls when he did go for it were really good. That's why I wanted to go back on the film and watch those because when you look at that, you know, he he was tremendous. All right, so let's let's talk about quickly like what does this mean for Ryan Day? Um So he's 56 and 7 overall. 3 losses to Michigan. 3 losses in a playoff. Man I mean, I I get it. I get it. People are upset, but man. Let me just state by saying, like, Ryan's a freaking good coach. Great human. Great coach. They got a good staff. This is what's so funny covering both of these teams is that each of them don't like the other. Each of them are excellent football coaches. The whole staff. You know, I love talking football with a lot of these guys. And pinch me, I get to do it. Whether I'm talking with Sharon or Jesse Minter, or whether I'm talking with Ryan or Brian Hartline, uh, Jim Knowles. These guys are good coaches. Really good. And unfortunately, you know, For Ryan, he's losing the wrong games for this fan base. He's won 89% of his games. He's 56 and 7. He recruits at a high level. And yet, they haven't lost this game three in a row since, what was it, the early 90s? This is not setting well with them. And all I'm going to say is, like, you're just going to have to know and believe that he can fix it. Because you can't change for change's sake. If you're going to change, you have to change to be better. Who makes you better? Because you're already at the top of the sport in a lot of ways. Now, have you won the national championship? No. Have you won the Big Ten? No. Have you beaten Michigan? No. You're within a breath of that. I mean, last year, you're within a breath of basically winning the national championship. You're within a breath on Saturday of winning that game. I mean, the the plays made versus the plays missed are just like, they are so small. The margins are so small. And for me, when the margins are that small, you you don't throw it out and start over. That's crazy. 
That's crazy. You start chasing it. You start bringing people in, you know, and being like, we're better than this. Okay, I get it. But the margins are so thin right now that you know what you do? You go to work and you just try to squeeze those margins. Get one or two more recruits. How do we do it? And they've gotten better. This game, like I just told you, was a lot different than 2021. Ohio State was much more prepared to play at the line of scrimmage with Michigan this year than they were each of the last two years. They did an outstanding job. Michigan did an outstanding job. Those were two great teams. One had to lose. It happened to be Ohio State. Ohio State has the number two ranked class in the country coming in and 24 right now. Five, five stars, including the number one overall recruit. Like, Ryan's going to get it done there. He's going to get it done. Just like, you know, like I thought it was crazy when Michigan wanted to run Jim Harbaugh off, even after the COVID year, right? And I'm like, well, okay, who who are you getting? I remember making this argument back then. Now, I didn't have this show to do it, but I would have said the same thing. There, You cannot change for change's sake. Who are you getting at Michigan that's better than Jim Harbaugh? Probably not many people, if anyone. Who are you getting that's better than Ryan Day? Because, like, Kirby and Nick aren't walking through that door. Those are, like, the only couple of coaches where I'm like, well, you know, those guys, they got the national championships. I think Ryan will do this. I think he'll get there. He's too good of a coach. You know, Urban's not coming back. Ryan's excellent. And that's, I just think it's overblown. And like, don't listen to like one player. I, I, I saw it. I saw the Maurice Claret tweet, you know, and listen, he's emotional. He's a former player. A lot of former players, we get emotional and he since deleted it. And I think that that's proper. That's, that's probably correct. Maurice said, Hey, Ryan day, love you, bro. But, but gotta go. That's incorrect. No, no. Maurice is wrong. Those of you thinking that are wrong. The margins are small, and he will get it done. That that was a phenomenal game that could have gone either way. Could have gone either way. Um, so that's that's my thoughts on Ryan Day. The whole A and M stuff that was never that's a no. Ryan's excellent. Okay. All right. A couple more things from this game. Uh, let's talk about those those small those those margins that I was just referring to. Um, Game really comes down to three things. One's a a, a review. One's an interception. One's a missed field goal. I already talked about the missed field goal. So now we get into the early interception by Kyle McCord. I've watched it over and over again. Um, Here's the thing that I think was the mistake from, from McCord. The mistake from McCord was thinking that he could just stand up and throw an in-breaking route on Will Johnson. Um, So I've studied both of these teams pretty extensively. And if you watch Will Johnson, what you'll see is that he's got six interceptions in his career, and four of them are on in-breaking routes. He does an exceptional job of sitting on routes, in particular when he has over-the-top help. And on that play, he did have over-the-top help. I thought Ohio State on that one, it looked like an RPO, and it looked like Kyle should have handed that ball off. It looked like they had numbers to block up front and that they should have handed it off. He didn't, and he chose to stand up and just throw it to Marvin. Now, here's where it gets difficult, is that if you are throwing a slant or an under route, something that's in-breaking, Generally speaking, as a quarterback, you're not reading the defender. You're trusting the wide receiver to break off of the inside shoulder. You're trusting the wide receiver to win inside. And if he gets beat over the top and cut off, there's nothing I can do about that. So as good as Marvin Harrison was, like a little fault falls on Marvin Harrison in in that play. Looks like an RPO. I think he should have handed the ball off. He doesn't. He comes up to throw it to Marvin Harrison. Not a bad idea, but two things happen. One is if you study Will, you know you can't just 
nondescriptly throw a slant on Will Johnson. That's exactly how he had four of his six interceptions, basically, uh, or at least two. He did the same thing in the Purdue game last year in the conference championship game. He did a similar thing on a combination route against Minnesota where the inside receiver was coming out to him and he had over-the-top help. Like, he's a squatter. And he's really good at it. And as soon as he feels like the wide receiver is about to break, his eyes go to the quarterback and then he breaks on the ball. This is what makes him so good. It's what makes him a five-star player and what I think could be an All-American. So that's a huge play. I know it happens in the first half, but it sets Michigan up to get an easy score and they're able to get a score. And that's the mistake. So do I feel for, for Kyle in some regard? Yeah, but in the other regard, it's like you got to know who you're throwing to. And if you've got numbers to run the ball, you've got to hand it off on an RPO. Uh, so that's my thoughts on that. And then the Roman Wilson touchdown and review. Okay, listen, I I get it. I know Michigan fans were irate with my thoughts on the play. Based on the looks I saw, I thought Roman did not have firm control for the amount of time necessary to make him a runner, which means that he would have had to complete the process of a catch. That's a total judgment call, all right? Now, others disagree with me. Dean Blandino thought that the play should have stood, okay? I thought, no, nah, I, you know, I, I didn't think he controlled the ball. Here's the thing that you need to know about me. I'm always going to tell you exactly what I think. Okay. I I just am. When, when the calls come up, I view that as my job. So I'm going to tell you what I think. That's what I thought of that play. And I know a lot of people thought that that, you know, made me biased or whatever, which clearly not the case. I don't have a dog in the hunt. Love covering both of these programs. That was a huge play, though, a huge play. And what I thought was really interesting when I watched that play on film, uh, Malik Hartford, number 25, he um, is staring at J.J. McCarthy. Roman Wilson is coming off of his right. And <coughs> sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Roman Wilson's coming off of his right. And right before J.J. goes to throw it, Malik Hartford looks to Roman Wilson to, like, look him up and start to cover him. But because of that, he didn't see J.J. actually make the throw. If his eyes just stay on the quarterback for one more beat, and I'm talking, like, a millisecond beat, he sees the throw, and it's the easiest interception of the game. But because his eyes had moved, and I'm not saying that he's wrong. I mean, he's sitting in kind of a, a whole safety position where, where over routes, he's going to have to look up and start to cover him. And so it's just kind of the timing and the sequence of everything that goes on. His eyes leave the quarterback, and right then the throw is made, and he never sees it. If, if his eyes are on the quarterback for one more beat, he, he makes the interception. But as it was, his eyes go to the wide receiver, and it becomes one of the great passes I've ever seen. He threads it. McCarthy threads it through two defenders. So he threads it through Burke and, and Hartford. Roman Wilson makes an incredible catch. Burke is, is pawing at his arm right away as he's going into the end zone. Phenomenal play. Phenomenal play. Um, in the end, they called it a catch touchdown. They stood with the ruling, and that's what it is. And you know what? That was a phenomenal play. And the game comes down to those three plays. If the call on the field would have been an incompletion or an interception, it would have stood. It wasn't. Miss kicked fielding, makes the first one, gets iced, misses the second one, and then the McCord INT, which sets Michigan up for a first and goal. And they're able to get into the end zone on fourth and goal. That's the game. And when you play a game between two teams that are, are that evenly matched, it's going to come down to something like that. It's going to come down to two or three or four snaps of the football. And, and it did. That was, that was pretty good. That was, that was as well of a big game as I've, I've seen played in a long time. Zach Zinter moment. 
This was a moment that's not a play in the game, but it's a moment in the game that kind of changes the whole outlook of the game. So Zach Zinter, number 65, the guard from Michigan. This is, this is in a lot of ways, the heart and soul, you know, of, of the offensive line of the offense of the program in some ways, you know, this guy is, is a senior. He comes back to play this year. Could have gone to the NFL last year. He started 41 games. He started since he was a true freshman. When we talk with Jalen Harrell, the outside linebacker de- defensive end before the game on Friday, you know, Gus asked him like, who, who is the guy that, that embodies, you know, what you want, the nastiness, the physicality. He's like, oh, big Zent, big Zent for sure. So he has the respect of the defensive players. He has the respect of the offensive players. And when he went down, um, listen, we didn't show it to you because it was like, he, we knew he pretty clearly broke his leg. And they were out there immediately with the cart. They were out there immediately with the air cast. And the players that saw him immediately, like on the ground, they knew it. So let me just take you through the moment. So he goes down and the air leaves the building. And it is quiet. You can hear a pin drop. And there's a lot of emotion from his teammates. Some of the other offensive linemen, guys that he's roomed with and been with forever, Trevor Keegan specifically, number 77, Carson Barnhart, you know, Trente Jones. I mean, these guys are veteran guys. They've been together for a long time and they've taken these transfers under their wing, Drake Drake Nugent, Ladarius Henderson. And when it's quiet and he's initially down and they're pumping up the air cast before he's on the cart, the team wasn't out on the field yet. There was just an an outpouring of emotion. Keegan, and this is in a commercial break, was hitting the ground with his helmet, crying. Other guys crying. You can see just state of shock. Even when we came back from break, you could still see that state of shock on their face. And then something happened that I've never experienced before calling games. Never experienced it before. Uh, Full disclosure, I've tried to tell this story in preparation for for this podcast. I've tried to tell this story twice today. Uh, Once to my wife and and another, my, my neighbor, who's an awesome guy. And I didn't get through it without crying. I'm emotional when it comes to college football because I know how much goes into it for these guys. So every time a a guy goes down and I know it's an ACL or an Achilles or a broken leg and it's like, hey, season's done. And in particular, when it's a senior or a guy that I know is not going to play college football again, like, you know, Zach Zenter, I get emotional. I get really emotional. And maybe it's just that I'm uniquely aware of, I have a lot of empathy towards what they go through, you know, what the teammates go through with them. You know, if you're Trevor Keegan, you've roomed with Zach Zenter, you're, you live with him, you know, where he came from, you know, his struggles, you know, what he went through to be here, you know, what his hopes and dreams are. And now you see him on the ground and his leg is broken right in front of your face. So it's like, it's an emotional time. And I get emotional when I see that stuff. So I'm in the booth and during the commercial, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm devastated. Sucks. I hate it. Regardless of the team anywhere, I hate it. I don't like to see injuries. Um, And then something happens. Through my headset, I have my headset on during the timeout. And it's hard to hear the crowd unless like the sound from the game is happening. And in commercial, we kind of like lose that nat, what we call nat sound, natural sound. And so it's hard for me to kind of like hear what's going on in the stadium during commercial. Even though my headset's on, I, I hear the stadium start to come alive. They're pumping up the air cast. The team is devastated. And the big house starts chanting. If I get emotional, I'm sorry. Let's go, Zach. Let's go, Zach. 
And it's not just one section. It's not just one area. It was the whole stadium. And it was loud. It was so loud, I took my headset off to hear it. And I was blown away. I've never heard a stadium that loud in a commercial break, ever. Ever. You know, save for like the jump around for Wisconsin or, or you know, something where it's a manufactured song. This was completely human element driven. No music, no band, no PA announcer. And the Michigan fans just start chanting for him. Right? I got emotional in the booth. And right then, here's what happens, is that the team goes from devastated to unified when this tsunami of emotion from the fans pours out onto the field. It was freaking loud. Again, I've never experienced anything like this. And and I'm what's what I hate is that you didn't experience it at, at home. Like you can't experience it that. And anybody that was there will tell you what I'm telling you is like that crowd with no music or anything lifted. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, this was wild. That team was devastated and lifeless for a moment, watching their their one of their leaders get his leg put in an air cast. And once that chant started in Michigan Stadium and it was loud and the energy was palpable, the team rose up, they stood up, and they walked out onto the field. So when we come back from commercial, that's what you see. And we'll put it up again, that whole sequence here that, that you just saw on YouTube. So we'll put it up again because I'm, you see all the players. And now they're up. And now and now they're standing there. So this is this is after the chant. And the chant, like, I'm telling you, that crowd at Michigan Stadium lifted Michigan up off the mat. They did. The team did not have it during that break until that chant. And then you can see them start to get resilient. And then you see him get put on the cart. And now, like, the stadium comes back alive, right? And now he, his fist goes up. And now they start to cheer. And now the players are, like, galvanized. And so now all of a sudden his team is like, all right, let's go do this for 65. Zach Center. What happens on the next play? Next play. Bam. Touchdown from Blake Corum. It was incredible. I've never seen anything like it in my career. Never seen anything like it. And then as Blake Corum runs into the end zone, it's the loudest I've heard Michigan Stadium in a long time. He runs right up to our camera, the Fox camera, and flashes the 6'5". You know, Zint's parents were there at senior day. And so they're getting hugs when he gets carted off. And then Blake Corum, boom, he breaks off a run. Sonny Styles from the safety takes a, a bad angle and boom, six, five, right in front of our camera. Oh, man. That, that was a, a pretty remarkable little sequence there. And the sequence that I got a bit emotional in. When we came back from commercial, I had to turn away from the field. I did not want you guys to hear on the broadcast my voice crack because I was getting emotional. So I turned from the field in the booth. I started looking at some of my charts and trying to re, <laughs> you know, center myself to not only talk about Zach Zenter quickly because we were going to come back from break. Here's Zach Zenter. Hey, he's the heartbeat of the team. He's 41 career starts and give some of that information, which you all deserve, but also like not get choked up because we got a game to play. So here we go. So I turned away from it when we came back from break and I didn't turn back to the field until right before the snap. So that's what's going on in the booth for me. 
And then, and then last thing that I'll say about the, the whole Zinter moment is that that crowd used to be like a nervous energy crowd at Michigan. When I first started doing games at Michigan, it was, it was always the, when is, when is this going to go wrong crowd? Um, and, and I get it, you know, they had the, they've had moments throughout the years where they, they get, you know, jaded and let down, but it was, it was always kind of that, that feeling in 2017 and 18 and 19, it was always that, okay, when is the play that's going to happen? That's going to break our back again. It was a nervous energy crowd. And, and I felt like at times that nervous energy even seeped into the team. Something happened in the fourth quarter against Ohio State in 2021. That that crowd had that energy, but then all of a sudden they realized in 2021, it's like, wait, we're going to win. And then all this stuff from that point forward, now it's a crowd that with, with an ex, like an expectant energy. They expect domination. They want domination. They know they're going to get domination, right? So it, it is totally changed. And then to see that crowd and experience what it was prior when I first started going there and to then what I experienced on Saturday in the booth with Gus, it, it was wild because I'm, I'm just telling you right now, that fan base with no prompting, that stadium lifted that team up off the mat. The team walked out onto the field. They all of a sudden were galvanized. All of a sudden, it's a touchdown. Blake flashes the 6-5, and it was really loud in a moment which could have gone the other direction. Uh, big picture outlook really quickly. Michigan, I think that they're better suited this year than either of the two previous years they went to the playoff. They obviously still have to beat Iowa. They'll be favored to do so in the conference championship game. But this is a better team, I think more well-rounded team than either of the previous two, even though they don't quite have the pass rush that the 21 team did. And maybe, you know, last year's team, you know, maybe was a little bit more dominant running the football. This one has elements of everything. They can throw the ball. You saw that with the tight end Colson Loveland. You saw that with Roman Wilson. They can run the football when they need to and want to. Saw that against Penn State. You saw that at times against Ohio State. The defense can put pressure on the quarterback. We saw that each of the last two weeks when Maryland and Ohio State started to get some rhythm in the passing game. They've got guys that can make plays on the outside. They're terrific in special teams. Their coaching staff is, is legit, and they make aggressive decisions, and they put their team in the best chance to win the game. This is a team that I think has a better chance to succeed in the postseason than each of the the, the previous two seasons that they've been there. They also have this... this togetherness you know the past three years man it's been it's been an interesting juxtaposition from the Michigan teams I was covering before COVID to the Michigan teams I was covering after COVID they believe in one another there's a love that's palpable within that organization and that program they love Jim Harbaugh they talk about each other with respect um it's it's not a, a program that you go in that talks about things that are going wrong or things that they don't have all they talk about are things that they do have, that things that are going right, and why they're going to be successful. They really love each other, and it shows when I go and meet them. And this seems like a culmination of that culture change since COVID. That's what this year has felt like for me. Now we transition to the Ohio State path forward. Okay, I think Ohio State still does have a path to the playoff. It's very small, but it is there. For all intents and purposes, last week was a play a play in game, um, or or an elimination game. I think is a better way to put it. But if you really look at this, I do think that there is a narrowing path right now for Ohio State, and this would be it. I believe that they need a a three team parlay this week, and then they would be in a position to potentially get included in the college football playoff. Because remember, it's tough to win on the road in a top five. Uh, uh, road environment. Top five teams are 31 and one this year in their home stadium. Alabama was the only loss. So like the way that they played and that game being such a great game, that's they'll be all right. They still have the Notre Dame win. They still have a very good resume. So now they need a three team parlay in order to get themselves into the playoff. 
They need the following three teams to lose. Alabama, Florida State, Texas. If those three teams lose, I think that I think I think Ohio State goes if those three teams lose. So I know it's small, but they need Georgia to win, they need Louisville to win, and they need Oklahoma State to win. And if those three things happen, then they've got a shot. And I would even say like a, a pretty good shot. If only two of those three things happen, I think they do not have much of a shot at all. So that's the path for Ohio State to get themselves into the playoff like they did a year ago uh, after a loss to Michigan. Thank you for watching the Joel Class Show YouTube channel. And if you like this clip, make sure to like it and subscribe to the channel. And you can stay up to date on all of my college football coverage.